Welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in today's episode we have a roundtable discussion with Lyndon Purcell, Director of Science at JPS, Danny Lennon of Sigma Nutrition and myself and this wasn't any ordinary podcast. Uh, we were very fortunate to have Danny come down to Melbourne and visit us at JPS in the lead up to our Optimizing Body Composition seminars. And we discuss, funnily enough, optimizing body composition and talk about some of the key concepts related to each of our presentations. And I'm sure that many of you are going to get a lot out of this. Lyndon will be covering the physiology of fat loss and muscle gain and why that's important to know for coaches and athletes. Danny will be discussing pragmatic dietary design and the importance of long-term planning for optimizing and enhancing body composition. And I'll be talking about program design for muscle growth and retention. So, I hope you guys enjoy this episode of the podcast. We still have tickets available to our upcoming seminars. We have the Gold Coast on the 24th of February, and then we have Sydney on the 2nd of March, followed by Ballarat, Wollongong, and Perth. And you can see all the details for locations and dates via the link in the description box below. I hope you guys enjoy this episode, and if you have any questions, feel free to drop us a comment. We'll be sure to get back to them. And today we are going to be talking about optimizing body composition and I'm very honored to have Lyndon Purcell, the hot and dongerous from JPS. Welcome John. Thank you, it's good to be here. And Danny Lennon, so he's come all the way down to Melbourne uh, to travel. Tell us a little bit about your trip so far. Danny, what have you been up to? Yeah, sure. So I've been in Australia for about six weeks now, I guess. I've uh, been in Brisbane, so my brother has been living in Australia for the past 10 months or so. So came over to see him for Christmas, hung out a bit. Um, now kind of made my way down to Melbourne, come see the place here, do our uh, seminar this weekend, and then hopefully knock out some good seminars in the coming weeks. So that's yeah. what I'm up to. And that is the topic of today's discussion. We're going to be talking about optimizing body composition and give you guys a little bit of an insight as to what we'll be presenting on in the coming weeks. Uh, so to start things off, we're going to talk about uh, Lyndon's presentation, which is on the physiology of fat loss and muscle growth. So I guess, Lyndon, first, we've really come to a very firm uh, mutual understanding that definitions are super important. <laughs> and uh, we think that people need to understand what they're talking about and the language that they're using. So what is body composition when we talk about in the context of uh, resistance training? Yeah, so for, <clears throat> for our purposes here today and for the seminars that we'll be presenting over the coming weeks, we are looking at basically the, the composition between, uh, the, or the ratio between muscle to fat that people have. You know, we might be looking at body fat percentage, total muscle mass, uh, yeah, a number of different things. There are so many things that make up the human body. Like even if we just looked at protein within the human body, we're going to have collagen proteins, non-collagen proteins, different things like that. But for the basic purposes of the, the strength athlete or the physique athlete, we're mainly just looking at total muscle mass, total fat mass. Awesome. And in terms of optimizing body composition, what is the definition of optimizing? You know, is, is it a fallacy that you can't or that you should be able to optimize diet, training, and body composition, or their trade-offs. We're going to talk about some of the things related to how we can pursue the best possible physique in terms of muscle mass and the least amount of fat mass. Yeah, so as, as we've discussed in the past, it's very important to define sort of on what level we're talking about things. When people say optimal doesn't exist, but sort of you should always push towards it, that is not my take on how optimal should be conceptualized. Optimal needs to be looked at within the situation and the context that we're speaking about it. So you can have an optimal program, at least in my opinion, for someone who is working a split shift, like you might have a nurse that's just done nights or something like that. Like she can have some form of optimality within her diet and training. So whenever we're speaking about optimal or optimization, we are basically looking at the most effective and efficient use of resources within that given 
context or situation. So something that, so yeah, that word. yeah. Well, you might say better, but I like my definition. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that is like one something you speak about in your presentation is uh, joint integrity and time are some of the most limiting things in gaining muscle. So an optimal training program is the one that creates the most stimulus within the 24 hours of a day, within the seven days of a week, within a month, or the most amount of muscle hypertrophy or retention with the minimal, minimal amount of joint stress and things like that. Like optimal is, it is not just looking at things like meal timing or frequency, it is looking at every variable that can undercut you and trying to address that and constantly just pushing towards better outcomes. Awesome, awesome. And what do you think the benefits are to learning uh, how to optimize body composition for the athlete, for the coach? You know, obviously not everybody needs to know how to optimize their body composition, but I guess in learning about it, what, what would be the benefits that we're hoping participants are going to get from the weekend? Um, that could carry over to strength athletes, you know, powerlifters or coaches who are even working with gen pop who might not need to optimize body composition, but what would they benefit from learning how to optimize uh, the variables within training plan? Yeah, I believe everyone can pretty much benefit from learning to optimize things because as we're all aware, adaptations and progress and you know, gains take a very long time to accrue. They are, it's a very slow process changing the human body in a safe and sustainable way. So if you learn to optimize variables and be efficient in your use of resources, then you can at least not delay that process any longer than it has to be. Like rather than gaining a kilo across eight months, a kilo of muscle across eight months, you might be able to gain a kilo of muscle across six months. Mm -hmm. It like we really wouldn't do this and try and stretch it out for any longer than we have to. So I think learning to how to do things the right way or sort of the best way or whatever you want to term it, most optimal way, <laughs> would is very beneficial. And then once you know the skills to do that and once you can learn the components and how much they contribute to that optimality, then you can dial things back when different life stresses and things like that enter the equation. Um, like an op learning to optimize body composition during times of low stress can give you, well for starters, like it's, it's very easy to maintain something once you've achieved it. So if you optimize things you know, while you're in uni holidays, then you might make great gains and then just maintain them during the uni year or something like that. Or you, know, you go back, you don't worry about meal timing, but you still track macros and calories or something like that. Like learning how to, firstly how to uh, the behaviours of optimality and then the components that contribute to those optimal outcomes are just super beneficial for everyone to learn and in particular coaches because they are the ones who are informing and instructing clients. Just to piggyback off that, I think the key is with that definition you have of basically the efficient management of resources in that you're not seeing optimal as how can every single person build as much mass as genetically possible. It's more a case of how do you efficiently manage these set number of resources. If you do that through optimization, then like you say, it, it might not even be getting to a result quicker. It could be saving a resource of money, right? You're not wasting your money on pointless supplements. You're not wasting uh, mental energy on the stress of spinning your wheel doing something way harder than it needs to be, right? So there's all these different resources that regardless of what your goal is performance-wise, even for the general person, if you learn what things will optimize your body composition, it's saving a multitude yeah. of resources, not just the results, right? Completely, yeah, awesome. And a big part of your presentation, the entirety of your presentation, is a discussion surrounding physiology, something that's uh, very near and dear to your heart and a topic you have sought out to learn back to front, inside out. And why is physiology so important to understand. A lot of people get bored with physiology or they think it's not important. 
um, you know, once they've learned just the basic stuff, um, you know, but you go into things in quite a lot of detail and depth. So why is it important for athletes and coaches to have a better understanding of how the body works? Um, so I, I could talk about this all day, why I think physiology is important, so I tried to narrow it down to three points. The first and, in my opinion, the most fundamental and important one is, as something we've just discussed before as well, is as healthcare practitioners, you should do no harm. Like, we are here to help people, not to hurt them. And at the end of the day, every action has consequences. And by learning, by learning physiology, you won't be duped by fads and you know, clickbait articles and things like that. So you're, you're probably keeping detrimental behaviours and um, interventions off the yeah. table. And then I guess we then have the consideration, like, sorry, the, the, the other thing I would say is even if something is not detrimental, it is, say, net neutral, like, it, you know, it's like maybe it's not the, the worst idea, but it shouldn't harm your progress. If something has a net neutral outcome, it is also costing you time and effort, energy, potentially money, like, there is, there is a cost associated with everything. So I think it is... For starters, the first important thing is, yeah, doing no harm, and by learning physiology, you at least tune your radar to some degree to picking up dangerous or just dumb interventions or ideas. The second is optimization. I think optimization should always come second to firstly doing no harm. People should be happy, healthy, safe, whatever. Then you worry about optimal. And the third and probably one of my more favorite reasons why I think physiology is a very good thing for coaches to study is I believe, or at least for myself, it has contributed to my intellectual development. There is something that is very beneficial about studying complex systems and the interactions that go on within complex systems. I think the human body is one of the most, it's, to me it's the most interesting organism on the planet. We are the most complex creature that evolution has produced and I think it is it can do your intellectual development a world of good by studying something like physiology because nothing nothing is a given like I always say for every gimme there's a gotcha um, and it is just yeah it, it is a fundamental piece of at least what has contributed to my knowledge and To me, someone, you could get, you could take two people, and this is something that I see, I guess, a lot in the, the rise of evidence-based fitness, is you have the people that have acquired all the right knowledge, and just that, and then all the people that have, this is, I think, one of the benefits of doing at least tertiary education or formal education, is you've gone about it in a slightly different way. Even if you end up with all the same answers as the people that have learned through obviously like the fantastic podcasts on Sigma Nutrition or the stuff that um, a number of people put out, there's a difference between having the right answers and knowing just how many wrong answers out there exist and why the right answers are the right answers. And yeah, before I crap on about physiology too much, it doesn't need to be physiology, but I've just found physiology really beneficial. Like I've found looking at stuff on economics beneficial, evolutionary psychology, sociobiology, like these all on a very conceptual level are just trying to understand the interactions within complex systems and they all tend to abide by the laws of or the rules or principles that we deem sort of economic principles and the human body is no different and you will all benefit from doing more physiology. <laughs> awesome. And just to sort of, I guess, recap what you'll be talking about, um, specifically relating to uh, physiology, is the physiology of fat loss and the physiology of muscle growth. So do you want to quickly give a brief summation of the physiology of fat loss and then the physiology of muscle growth? Ooh, very tricky. Um, as it relates to our goals and a body composition, context, the physiology of fat loss is fat does a lot more than just make you look bad. 
it is an important sort of endocrine organ. Um, it has very strong influences on hormones. A lot of people tend to worry about fat and hormones in the incorrect order, in my opinion. They worry about hormones and how they can affect fat, but we should probably be more so looking at it in the context of how fat affects hormones. When you're trying to get rid of body fat, you basically go through a three-step process, which is lipolysis, which is the splitting of fatty acids from the, from the fat cell, transport in both the bloodstream, then we reach like the oxidizing cell and this transport from within the cell into the mitochondria, and then there's oxidation. Uh, a lot of fat burning supplements like L-carnitine or something like that targets transport within the, the oxidizing cell and it takes the fatty acid to the mitochondria. However, that's not often the rate limiting step in the process and I'm that's why... Time. No, I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna save, you gonna save did, you, did you look at the slides? No, I haven't. Oh, no, okay. I, just, I just remember the analogy. It's really, it's a really long analogy, so I'm gonna say okay. I'm gonna <laughs> test it out on the weekend. So no, it's, it's <laughs> basically it's about being on a, a night out, like when you're oh. when you're drunk. And you, so you, you change it. You fine tuned it. I fine tuned it. Fine yeah. tuned it. <laughs> so you got to come along to the seminar, guys. Um, so that that is the fat, uh, the physiology, I guess, of losing fat roughly, and funnily enough, being in an an energy deficit really upregulates all those processes. Physiology of muscle growth is relatively simple, although muscle is probably a more complex um, component of the body. Muscle hypertrophy primarily occurs through individual muscle cells getting larger. We may acquire more muscle cells over time although that's rather disputed in humans and the kind of practices that have been used in order to observe hyperplasia, which is the growth of or the increase of cells, are rather inhumane kind of practices. So they're not things that are feasible for humans to undertake. So we mostly need to be worried about growing bigger cells from what we've already got. In order for a cell to get bigger, and this doesn't just apply to muscle, but a cell basically needs to build more protein, store more energy than it does break down or release. So we need our muscle cells synthesizing more protein than they are breaking down. The best known stimulus for this is mechanical tension. We're all experiencing some level of mechanical tension now as we sit here in our chairs resisting gravity to some degree. However, resistance training, the reason it grows muscle is because it it exacerbates gravity and it, it skyrockets the amount of mechanical tension that we experience. This is the best known way of skewing that balance. Metabolic stress, muscle damage may also have implications on that balance, but mechanical stress is where you want to be focusing your efforts. Awesome. Very, very good. That grows muscle. Yeah. Thank you, John. So, yeah, guys, Linda will be presenting on the physiology of fat loss and muscle growth. Uh, so yeah, thank you, John. Mr. Lennon, your yeah. turn, my man. We've got, guys, we have a camera here today recording. Uh, Danny was quite uncomfortable with this. He said that he was on radio for a reason. Yes, <laughs> not by accident. <laughs> not any uh, accident. Very conscious decision. <laughs> <laughs> so Danny, talk to us. The role of nutrition in body composition uh, enhancements. A lot of people throw around these silly figures 80% diet, 20% exercise, and there is a, a pretty well-established understanding, at least from, from what I see, that people recognize how important diet is for nutrition. Um, but what is the true role uh, in, of nutrition for body composition enhancement? Yeah, sure. So I think first off, it's probably important to recognize any of those percentage breakdowns just are worthless. <laughs> They're kind of meaningless, to be quite honest. That, like they don't really mean much, right? To say 80% of your results come from the kitchen or whatever phrase that, like that doesn't mean it's anything. Made in the kitchen or right. Yeah, there. like it just means nothing. Um, you could probably make a case specifically for muscle gain that's even less true in that probably one of the main things people miss specifically for building muscle is that by far the biggest important factor is resistance training, your training programming. Um, 
even beyond even calories, never mind any of the other small little details we can get into. We can probably discuss that a bit later. Um, but from a general overview, I think for body composition enhancement, um, as Lyndon said, we're looking at two primary things really. Uh, working at changing the amount of fat tissue and changing the amount of muscle tissue. Nutrition is talked about probably quite a lot because I think it's probably the most readily modifiable by most people and will lead to the biggest changes immediately. So we know, for example, unless someone's like brand new to the gym and they start lifting weights, they can probably see some decent body comp changes pretty quickly in, in muscle mass. But beyond that, changing muscle with training programming or for anyone who's tried to lose body fat just through exercise alone without modifying diet, that can take a bit longer. Whereas if someone goes on a, and changes their diet rapidly, you almost see results very quickly. So it's one of the ones where you see changes quite quickly. Um, you can change things quite drastically depending on someone's starting point. And so there's probably a list of nutritional related factors that we could probably modify that would change someone's body composition. Uh, so that goes all the way from energy balance, macronutrients, uh, micronutrition, phytonutrients, uh, the timing of meals, uh, the doses of certain compounds, so like the leucine uh, dose per meal, um, supplementation, hydration status, a, a long list of things that we can modify each step. Uh, however, they're not all equal. And some of those factors carry a lot more weight than others. And this is why you have a number of people who have tried to classify this in the hierarchy whether that's the nutritional pyramid people have seen, Eric Helms um, put out, I think Renaissance Periodization have a similar kind of idea, uh, Bradshaw, pretty much anyone you can talk to about nutrition will say, yeah, there's a hierarchy of different factors that have a different amount of impact, um, and they may represent that differently, but pretty much most people would agree that some things have a bigger impact than others. And so nutrition is about if we can modify these factors by changing your diet, we can change the amount of fat mass you have, which have muscle mass, and so on. So, awesome. I think that answers the question. Yeah. Hopefully, yep. It did. Maybe. And in the in terms of building muscle, you started to touch on it. Then, uh, what are the misconceptions surrounding nutrition for uh, muscle growth? You spoke right. about how people often place too much emphasis on their diet and calories to build muscle, when yep. in fact, you know, it's resistance training that is the potent stimulus causing the growth. Um, so what are some other misconceptions surrounding right. nutrition? Sure. So to kind of just recap on that one, uh, getting the resistance training stimulus right is super important. Um, if someone has a terrible training program or just has no training program, it doesn't matter how many calories or how much protein you eat, you're not really going to see any change in muscle mass um, typically. Um, beyond that, and kind of on a related note, when it comes down to what you would change nutritionally to try and drive gains in muscle mass. The two big ones that people talk about is caloric intake and protein intake. Um, similarly, I think the same thing happens where people over uh, emphasize these to the point where thinking more is better. So thinking that, well, if I'm told to eat a bit more calories to drive muscle gain, then if I eat a ton of calories extra, that will drive even more. And that's just simply not the case. So what's required is just a certain amount of surplus energy to maximally allow you to adapt to the training stimulus you've got going on. And anything above that isn't really gonna allow you to build muscle quicker. That's not the thing that's limiting how much muscle you're building. And that's gonna be, again, your training stimulus. So you wanna provide enough to, number one, recover, but then also to adapt to that stimulus and grow more muscle. And for most people, that's gonna be typically quite a small surplus relative to the numbers people probably typically see. Um, similarly with protein, you have a, a similar scenario. Up to a point, a high protein diet is gonna be beneficial for, again, maximizing uh, nitrogen balance, muscle protein balance, but anything more than that isn't gonna drive more muscle gain per se. And so what you're looking at there is trying to, number one, maximize or, or hit an optimal amount of protein over the day but ideally split into a certain number of meals, probably three to five high protein meals um, that go beyond a certain leucine threshold as, get, as well. We can get into that if you want. Um, but anything above that, just eating more and more protein will drive more muscle gain. So I think they're probably the main misconceptions of uh, what influences uh, those nutritional components have. And probably the final one that I forgot to mention is 
better to food choices. I think uh, in certain groups or kind of communities, you will see an overemphasis on what food choice does for gaining muscle and losing body fat. And so if we take it separate to health for humans, simply changing your body composition, if we take care of caloric intake, macronutrients, timing of say protein and so on, then specific food choices have a, such a small impact that to the point where they're almost negligible. So uh, one common issue with muscle gain, for example, is people thinking, if I'm eating in this surplus to gain muscle, I want to do it from clean food so I don't put fat on as well, right? Um, or if I eat dirty foods while I'm gain in the gaining phase, I'll build more fat. It's just not really true in that it's, again, your calorie intake and macronutrient intake with that resistance training will dictate how much you're going to build and it's food choice doesn't really dictate how much fat you will put on in that time point, the calorie surplus that you're in as well. Fantastic. And in terms of fat loss, uh, what are some of the common pitfalls uh, that people make when they're trying to improve their body composition and lose fat? Because we do see a lot of people uh, you know, in the evidence-based community, fitness community, or just at the gym, who want to get leaner and build muscle. Um, most people don't have too much of a problem eating at the calorie surplus, we know that, um, but a lot really struggle with the fat loss. Mm. And what do you think some of the, the issues are that are making it harder for people to successfully diet down mm. to a, a, an appropriate body fat percentage um, that's going to enhance their cosmetics um, and allow them to you know, improve their overall mm. body health? So the way I've tended to think of this is that as with pretty much most things in nutrition, it's somewhere in, in the middle of a spectrum of two extremes. And at the two extremes is where people tend to run into problems. So one end, most people within evidence-based community have came across this of people who go with a protocol that's super restrictive on food choices, overly restrictive, and it makes it so difficult to stick to that they're not going to comply with the diet for long enough to see a result. So they ban a ton of foods, they have a very narrow food choice, um, and they, again, it could be clean eating, it could be carnivore diet, it could be whatever. Restricting foods in the belief that will lead to more fat loss than if they were to include other foods. On the other end, though, we have a similar problem that happens when people take that to the other extreme, of thinking, well, it comes down to calories and macronutrients, and to my last point, totally true, if you eat in a calorie deficit, need enough protein, then regardless of your food choices, you're going to be losing body fat. However, if people take that to the extreme and do like the super, if it fits your macros on steroids type deal of like complete junk food all day long, the problem there is not from an acute setting, it's from, again, an adherence perspective. It's making that diet a lot harder than it's going to be if you include a diet full of minimally processed foods, high in protein, high in fiber, lots of vegetables that have a low calorie density, and typically foods that aren't gonna be so hyper palatable that it's easy to overeat. So whilst two diets match for calories and macronutrients will have a similar effect in the short term, one will probably come at much higher hunger levels. So if we can moderate that by including better food choices, you're gonna be better off. So there are two extremes that I see. People like being so restrictive, it's gonna be difficult to stick to a calorie deficit, and the other end, people being so liberal with trying to fit just complete junk in the diet all the time within a certain macro range that it becomes so difficult because they're hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And what do you think that coaches and athletes or lifters, anyone really trying to improve their body comp, are running into troubles with when designing a diet, not just over the short term, but the midterm? And the long term, and I'd, I'd almost suspect that not many are really planning out for the long term. And, and why is that beneficial um, you know, for long term body composition? Sure. So uh, this kind of to kind of jump to the punchline. This is kind of kind of part of what I'm going to be presenting on of this. I've, I've turned it nutritional macrocycles, mesocycles, and microcycles. So taking the same concepts that coaches would be familiar with from uh, training periodization and applying, how does that apply to nutrition? Can we put things in the same framework? Because I just noticed a lot of the times while people are very in tune with how we need to plan over long term, have phases that stick together, and mesocycles and microcycles that build on one another within training, when it comes to nutrition, it's like, okay, we'll put someone on these set 
nutrition rules and we want to be dieting sustainably and just let them do that. And really, uh, there's a few problems with that. One is that it doesn't need to be that way and there's a lot of benefits from doing it differently. So you can have phases that are in fact unsustainable and you can use them correctly at the right time for a certain purpose. So with this macro cycle, meso cycle, micro cycle model that I had is instead of the macro cycle being like a year of training, we could think of that as what is the long-term approach or philosophy or long-term goal that we're trying to achieve with someone. From there, we can break that down into distinct dieting phases. So that would be the equivalent of these um, kind of meso cycles where within those phases you can have a different priority, a different goal. You may be losing fat at a different rate between different phases. You may be gaining uh, weight in certain ones. You may be maintaining, focus on performance. That can change. And then within each of those mesocycles, you can look at on a week-to-week -week basis, things can be different as well. Um, and even then, on a, on a weekly basis, it can undulate across the week, your intake, the same way as across one microcycle, your training days will undulate and then repeat the following week. So essentially, it's trying to take how do we take look at both the short term of on this day specifically what behaviors and habits does someone need to follow all the way up to where should they be over a long period of time and what do those phases distinctly look at in between instead of taking that someone that has maybe i don't know 50 kilos of body fat to lose and say well we're going to diet them at trying to lose half a kilo a week and we're going to do that for a year right it's just like never going to work so uh, having that mindset of planning in the long term in distinct phases within it. Fantastic. And I think it, it's really useful on something that we've been doing here for a while at JPS is viewing nutrition through a much wider lens. Um, but some of the problems I guess uh, we have run into with these kind of long term plans, um, and I'm sure many coaches will run into, I'm sure you'll have the answer for this, um, is that it, it's hard to know whether or not a client's is going to be with you for that duration of time or an athlete. So how does a coach navigate, uh, you know, investing all the time to plan and set up these things, um, you know, to ensure that they are doing, you know, what's best for their client um, and know that it's going to be a worthy investment the client's not going to buy it? Sure. It's a really good question. And I would probably frame it the same way as we probably talk about it with training as well. So whilst for a specific training block, if you're going to plan that for someone now, um, it's unlikely you're just going to think of that in isolation and not have any clue what they're going to do after the next six weeks. You're going to have that, especially if, let's say they have a powerlifting meet in six months time, it's going to be building towards that. However, the program you give them for the next six weeks, that will probably have a lot of detail in there and what they're going to be doing each set. You're not going to have that same level of detail for their peaking strategy into that meet because you're not there yet. However, you'll still have a general idea of where you want them to be. So this kind of macro cycle model we apply to nutrition is having an eye on, okay, generally this is where I would like them to go and this is the phase we'll probably move through. But for the, the detailed granular stuff, you only need to do that for the next period of time and get them through that distinct phase. And so the rest of it becomes quite dynamic. So instead of planning six months out ahead to the T, you should probably have like a number of weeks ahead and then dynamically let that progress and the monitoring and what they're reporting to you change. Mm -hmm. Similarly, what you're probably going to do on a week-to-week -week basis with nutrition, right? We can target whatever we want for an eight-week block, but at each weekly check-in with a client, we're going to change things up and down based on what they're reporting. And you would do the same with training. I, I th maybe some people do it. I know they do, but it's, I would question if it's optimal to say, okay, I'm going to plan out six months' worth of training for someone and I know that on the very final week in six months' time, what sets, reps, and load they're going to have on the bar, yeah. it's probably not going to be effective. You should be able to modify that throughout those number of months depending on their progress. And it's so trying to take that model and apply it the same way as nutrition. Yeah, awesome. And that's pretty much what we do. But there are a lot of people who uh, I've spoken to about this kind of concept and they've, they've come at me with the question of why would I invest that much time with clients who I don't know are going to be with me for that long um, and I had a very similar kind of discussion so fantastic to know um, and is there anything that you want participants on the weekend specifically to take away from your presentation so three things what would they be? I don't know like the way I tend to set things up is that different people will probably take something different from it and so as long as they can come away with at least one 
like four idea, that would probably be enough to make like quite a dramatic difference to your practice, hopefully. Like if you're going somewhere and, and taking a, like a big idea away from it that you can put in, in place, it's probably gonna have a knock-on effect to help you. So I don't know if I would kind of list out like specific things, but the, the idea that I'll try and get people is to just how to reframe the nutritional framework, how to think not only in the long term, but how that applies to the focus for their clients on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and we'll, it, yeah, it's hard to get into without ex explaining too much, but yeah, it's going, taking them through that whole thing, I just think. It's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Anything you want to ask Danny, John? No, I, I think that was an excellent point about what he said. It's like, not everything has to be sort of sustainable. Like, mm. there is, there is a good move, like every good movement has its consequences and the, the incorrect implications that are drawn from the message you're just trying to push. And something like, the, if you can't see yourself doing this diet in 10 years time you know it's the wrong diet for you and that is that is something that I don't completely disagree with but that can be taken to the wrong extreme like if you diet correctly maybe you only need to diet for a year and then you don't need to diet for the nine years that then take you to that 10 year mark like there are not everything has to be sustainable in the longest term and the long-term approach is not always the you know, the morally superior approach sort of a thing. Um, essentially, like when you are trying to to temper my view and my discussion on optimality with Danny's discussion on sustainability or something like that, you're effectively just trying to run a race and get there without puffing yourself out before the line but without finishing with too much gas in the tank either like and it's just understanding how far you've got to run you know the weather conditions you're going to encounter the hills there's things like that and a well-informed coach is in a position that's just well and truly viable to guide their client through that process i think, I think yeah I, I agree i think a lot of the unsustainable approaches are problematic because there is no long-term planning right. and there is no exit strategy right. or um, you know, a graded approach to sustainability and yes. then back and forth. It's just the adopted with the perception of this is the only way I can achieve my goals. Yep. Um, and that's hugely problematic for yep. a number of reasons. Yeah, and that, that's what when someone says, I was thinking about trying this particular type of strategy, whether it's like a protein spray and modify fast or any other type of like aggressive kind of weight loss method. The, the main question is, well, what's the plan after that? Like, if you have a, if you know what your next phase is going to look like and how you're going to transition into that and how you're going to eat from that week on, then you can kind of mitigate most of those potential downsides. If it's, I'm going to do this and then go back to eating normally, you're probably not in the best place to judge what normal eating is after an aggressive diet. Yeah. Spot on. Cool. Spot on. So uh, let's talk a bit about your presentation, man. Yeah. You're talking about muscle growth. I am. I've got um, a PhD in gym. There we go. <laughs> and uh, how many times are you gonna cash that one? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> until the end of the, this little tour that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we talk about obviously in, in my part the role of nutrition in body composition change, and we touched on uh, how resistance training is probably more important for muscle growth, or at least to get that right. So why is that the case? What's going on when we're when you're programming resistance training? What are you trying to achieve through that, and how is that leading to muscle growth? Yeah, fantastic. So, much of my presentation piggybacks off Lyndon's uh, eloquent discussion around the physiology of muscle growth. Um, but most importantly, resistance training is the most potent stimulus, you know, to alter protein, you know, balance, um, and it's true to the mechanical tension that we experience through the resistance of barbells, dumbbells, cables, all of those things. Um, that you know, we move through space to oppose gravity. Um, and what I'll be discussing and why resistance training is important for, for building muscle is that given it's the most potent stimulus to build muscle, um, we need to learn how to optimize the uh, acute training variables uh, that we have at our disposal, so the tools that we use in the gym to make sure that we are designing a program that achieves our overarching physiological objective within training which is to increase the magnitude of tension, so that is the 
tension placed on the fibers uh, when they're contracting, the duration that they're exposed to that tension, because that is what leads to you know hypertrophic signaling um, that causes growth, essentially. So, yeah, that is uh, why resistance training uh, is, is really important to understand in the context of building muscle. I feel that a lot of people are starting to, and again, this is my bias because you know, I only see what I see and only hear what I hear, but um, I, I feel like a lot of people are getting a better handle of program design on average, which is great, um, but I still think a lot of people misapply the fundamental training principles. Um, they get a little bit too caught up in methods. Uh, for example, you know, they see Mike Hizretel, this is his method of progressing volume across the mesocycle and how he uh, utilizes his progression of the stimulus to account for his uh, maximum recovery volume and minimum recovery volume and volume landmark concepts. Um, and they think that that's the way to do it. They don't understand the underlying principles. They look to the method and then they contrast that with, say, Eric Helms, who, although he's uh, altered his opinion a little bit, I think, over recent years, um, and does definitely pay a little more credence to volume increasing over time, um, people contrast their uh, methods um, mm -hmm. because Eric's a little more conservative in you know, using double progressions, which is adding reps uh, first and then adding load once you reach a certain rep range and then starting top end of the rep range, starting back to the bottom of the rep range. Uh, and, and they get really caught up on, well, which is right. And I get a lot of people asking me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through social media, um, you know, what do you think of Mike Isratel's you know, progression in volume, adding sets each week, or Eric's, uh, you know, double progression. And it's, it's concerning to see people getting so bogged down on these details and comparison of methodologies when you know, both are cor like correct, mm, right. technically by the principles, because they're abiding by you know, the law of progression, right? Pro progressive overload, that is right. the principle that they're uh, applying. Um, you know, specificity. So they're training to increase the magnitude and duration of tension to achieve the training objective that we have for building muscle. Um, you know, they're managing fatigue by having, you know, lighter days. Uh, you know, there's a number of similarities um, mm -hmm. because when you look at the principles, uh, you can start to see the method. And, you know, uh, an example we use is that when you understand the principles, it's when you start programming, it's like being in the matrix. You can, you know, essentially see everything. Um, right. And that's what I want to teach people in my presentation is to think outside the box. I actually moved that slide. If you like it? I think yeah. That's <laughs> an inside joke. I had a slide of Lyndon wearing a box around his uh, waist, and I said, "Think outside the box." <laughs> um, wearing nothing. But, but he's wearing that nothing. Box. <laughs> yeah, well, better than thinking inside that box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I just want to help uh, participants, you know, coaches and athletes better understand the principles. Um, and how to apply the cute training variables to uphold our overarching objective for muscle growth, which is, again, like I said, increasing tension over time to make sure that we get that mechanical stress that we need to signal growth. Right. So if the, the other kind of things that people sh should be aware of are, is, is how resistance training is having its effect on muscle growth. Are there any incorrect ideas you see promoted around the internet or elsewhere mm -hmm. from people mistakenly something is driving muscle growth. Right. Yeah, it's funny. I, Lynn and I had a little discussion this morning about that. So I think there's there's still, I wouldn't necessarily say it's even resistance training because I think everybody understands that resistance training builds muscle. I don't think that's the problem necessarily. Um, and I think people are starting to appreciate that volume uh, is an important variable when it comes to hypertrophy. Uh, but there are some some poor understanding from what I have seen of the physiology of muscle growth and how the principles and the mechanisms of muscle growth uh, apply to the acute training variable. So you see people, uh, you know, trying to elicit muscle damage. They're trying to, you know, get a pump um, because they think the metabolic stress is what's going to, you know, signal growth. So it's not necessarily that they don't understand the the program design aspect. The program design is fundamentally flawed. Because of their poor understanding of the physiology, right? Um, so it's a downstream effect. What's actually, what's actually exerting its effect? Correct. Right. Yeah. Correct. But yeah, that was something I'm I was actually going to. Yeah. <laughs> because as coaches, we are limited to observing practical and trackable outcomes and variables. Without that fundamental understanding of physiology, you 
really can go down some garden paths. Like there's um, one of the studies on rest periods from memory it is it's like there's something like so a lot of coaches track volume load or something like that, and there was a thirteen percent decrease in volume load in one of the groups, but a fifty percent decrease in its effect on muscle protein synthesis. And as a coach, you like without a physiological understanding, you don't, you can't uh, collate those two differences. Like there are there are strong physiological theories that can explain why what occurred. But as a coach, if you're just going, yeah, volume load's going up over time, they get they should be gaining muscle. I don't know, scale weight's going up, volume load's going up. Like there is a reason that we we structure our talks like this because. As we know, nutrition augments training. They, they all tie into each other, one another. Physiology informs principles. Principles inform methods. Yeah. It's sequential. Definitely. And that's, you know, in large part, the, my ability to see a lot of the, the pitfalls that people are making with their training and how they structure their programs is in large due to, you know, improving my understanding of physiology, you know, thanks to a lot of what Lyndon's presenting and him doing all the hard work really and I just get the, the quick bits um, you know too much and it, it hurts my head so I just like things <laughs> nice and simple Danny um, but yeah I guess it, it would be misapplying the principles of muscle growth and the mechanism and what's causing muscle growth so they're looking to you know, create muscle damage so through you know, super slow eccentric training um, they're, they're trying to create a pump uh, specifically you know and although that could lead to growth because they're getting you know more attention over time if they, they are training harder, right. um, you know, they are misapplying the fundamental um, idea of what they're trying to get out of training. As well as, I would say that a lot of people in the in recent years have become very much uh, overzealous in uh, applying progressive volume overload. They've just really focused on adding sets. Right. And it's almost become a you know, knee-jerk reaction that, you know, when you want to grow, add sets. And they don't understand a lot of the, the implications of that long term, um, not just to, you know, joint health and things like this, um, but also to, you know, the short-term injury management, you know, just looking to things like the acute to chronic workload ratio, you know, having that big spike in volume because, oh, hey, you know, new study came out, more volumes, you know, superior to, <laughs> to smaller doses of volume. Uh, that's really problematic. And I guess all of this really stems from people's understanding and, and definition of things as well. It's like, you look at volume, it's like volume is just the dose of training. Um, and, w and when you understand that, okay, it's the dose of training, well, adding one rep is increasing the dose. So he's adding 2.5 kgs on the bar. So he's adding a set two. Right. You know, they're all increasing the dose. They, they have different magnitudes of effect um, because you know increasing the dose in terms of um, you know, it, it depends on how you measure, whether you're measuring dose by hard working sets per week, volume load, you could be counting effective reps, there's a lot of different ways to go about. Um, but again, the volume uh, has been, the volume research and a lot of the interest in volume of late has caused a lot of misunderstandings for people because they don't understand the definitions and they don't know, uh, you know, we're not comparing apples with apples a lot of time. Right. They're discussing volume with someone who's talking about hard working sets, and that the person who they're talking about it with over here is defining it as you know volume load. So nobody's on the same page, having the same discussion. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to just better understanding the principles and how that applies to the methods. Yeah, I think that's a good example because if you don't understand those principles and you don't understand some physiology and you're simply bought into, well, I heard volume is gonna drive more hypertrophy, yeah. then how are you gonna to explain to someone, well, why don't I just do 25 sets of bicep curls at super low RPEs, and am I gonna get the same impact, right? I'll just like do something like six reps left in the tank all the time, yeah. and never work hard, and if your only answer is, well, as long as you're getting enough volume, you can't explain because you don't understand these other variables. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, and that's where Again, you know, we need that mechanical tension. That comes down to training with high absolute loads, you know, because that's going to recruit uh, high threshold, you know, motor units, those fibers that are most likely to grow. Um, 
or training under fatigue conditions. You know, you've got to do one of those two things. Um, so you can have all the volume in the world, um, and if you're doing one of those two things or both, then you won't be training with much volume for too long. Um, you know, so you do have to be very strategic in how you uh, increase volume, and by volume I am referring to number of hard working sets per week um, you know, in the context of body composition. So, yeah, people need to not only understand the definitions of um, you know, the key variables, the key acute training variables, but also uh, the relationship between these variables as they apply to a training program and the implications of you know, increasing one or decreasing the other and how that affects uh, training outcomes and their progress long term with, with their physiques. Sure, so let's talk a bit about energy balance because uh, I've already mentioned that probably if you were to look optimally for a muscle gain phase, you probably want to run a slight mm. surplus, although people can still build muscle in a calorie deficit. But more from the perspective I'm interested to ask when it comes to programming and how you would typically program for someone trying to maximize hypertrophy, or how, do you, how does energy balance play into some of the programming considerations and what you can and can't do depending on someone's calorie intake? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I think the discussion, I, we just spoke about this last week, is best framed around getting things set up correctly uh, with an appropriate level of calories to allow for recovery and adaptation, which means that would be a calorie surplus. Because once you have uh, the understanding of you know, somebody's recovery, their adaptation into calorie surplus, um, that's where most of the muscle growth is going to occur. And then when you want to lose fat, um, the process of altering the training program will be simply refining and adjusting their current program. So it's, it's not a, oh, this is a program for cutting, this is a program for gaining. It's how can we set up the program to maximize hypertrophy? And then when we're dieting, we want to essentially aim to keep as many pieces of the puzzle at the same because that's going to retain the muscle. Um, but in many cases, when you know, the rate of loss or the duration of the uh, calorie restriction or the absolute weight change uh, you know, relative to the individual starting point um, is such that it starts to cause recovery issues, then we need to start to modify the program. So if we can get things set up uh, at least you know, optimally when somebody's in a calorie surplus, we've got our starting point for how we're going to approach training during a cutting phase. And generally speaking, you want to make as minimal adjustments as possible, but there are some uh, implications of calorie restriction when we cut um, that require modification to the training frame, simply because we don't have enough energy and resources to recover and adapt as we would when we have an, an abundance or a surplus of calories. Um, and drawing on Mike Isratel's volume landmarks, he um, you know, outlines how when we're in a calorie deficit, uh, catabolic signaling will increase, and as our recovery drops down, the maximum amount of volume that we can recover from gradually diminishes. But what also happens simply as a function of an increase in net metabolism is our minimum effective volume, so the amount of uh, volume or training stimulus that we need to maintain our muscle increases. So in fact, the window of opportunity to adapt decreases and gets smaller. So it's a lot harder to stay in that window to maintain the muscle without overreaching or overshooting things and not recovering. Um, and then to again explain to people how that changes when we go into a calorie surplus, the window simply starts to open up again. Right, we're recovering better, and we need less stimulus because we, we're not at risk of losing muscle because we're um, you know at a surplus. We're not we're not dieting right. So um, that's primarily the the overarching concepts related to um, the implications of energy balance to program design. There's a lot more. Um, nuance to it than that and it, all it takes is someone to die down you know below their settling point and they'll know very well that hey training is just not the fucking same you know when you're on like 1800 calories right. and like eight percent body fat um you know little things like uh you know your joints just don't handle you know higher absolute loads as well when you diet it down um you know you will be more tired fatigued and less motivated in the gym so um Adherence. I've never heard anyone say adherence. 
<laughs> we say adherence. <laughs> um, so adherence suffers when people have died. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I was going to bring so, up after. A million things that I don't pronounce correctly. So well, I, I, figured, a... I figured Danny, this is how Danny pronounces it, so he must be right. Yeah, um, I know, I'm usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I say stuff weird all the time. Um, so adherence suffers when people are dieting, um, you know, in energy restricted conditions. Um, yeah, so there's just a number of considerations we need to have uh, in program design to make sure that people are going to the gym and they're training hard and they're getting that stimulus, that mechanical tension that they need to retain the muscle. And, and that's, again, a huge uh, distinction. You mentioned that you can build muscle in a calorie deficit, and this is definitely um, you know, true in, in limited situations, but for most experienced lifters, they're not going to uh, experience any um, you know, significant muscle growth in a calorie deficit. Um, you know, so the goal changes. You know, we're trying to retain muscle, um, which, which again, gives us a little bit more flexi flexibility because, like Lyndon said, um, you know, maintenance is generally a little bit easier than getting adaptations moving in a, in a forward direction. So, so yeah, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we're, I think we're coming close to time, so I'll wrap it up with maybe one more question. Um, it's raining. It's raining now. Danny was Danny was complaining fifty minutes ago that it was just too hot in Melbourne, and I, didn't and I said, "You wait, my friends." <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it was literally like thirty six degrees when I was walking in here, and it's now like heavily raining. <laughs> that was an hour ago. This is incredible. Um, so yeah, if, if people can still hear us, uh, final question. We're just going to wrap up on if we take that long term view, that kind of long term progression. What are some of the things that typically undermine people's ability to make progress in the long term? The long term? There's a lot of factors that influence uh, people's ability to build muscle over time. Because muscle growth, like Lyndon said, isn't just stringing one or two workouts together. It isn't a few hard weeks or even a few hard months of training. It's years and decades of hard training and being able to do that consistently. Um, and that doesn't mean you should train hard every session. Um, but it does mean on average your training needs to get harder at times. So you need to stay in the game. So there's a number of uh, obstacles that people face when it comes to staying in the game. Uh, you know, enjoyments and uh, you know, motivation is obviously a big one. But you know, assuming that we have those things and we, we have lifters who are eager to continue training and they're not worried uh, or derailed by loss of motivation or enjoyment, um, it's going to come down to two things, which are time generally because you know getting more, when you get when you get bigger you get stronger and you can lift more weights so your training sessions are going to start to take longer periods of time for example if i want to work up to you know heavy set of five on the squads uh, it takes me a good five uh, sorry a good 30 minutes to do so um and then if i want to get any more effective volume after that well i, I might only have an hour of training and i might not be able to get you the amount of volume that I need to get in 30 minutes, um, assuming that I do have an hour. Um, so a huge limitation for a lot of people as they get more advanced is time. So being able to get the you know, effective uh, stimulus and more of that stimulus uh, in the amount of time they have available to allocate to their training. So uh, that's one big factor. We talk about some of the strategies that athletes can use to help uh, mitigate time constraints. Um, and the other one is joint integrity. So just knowing how to preserve your joints and understanding the implications of uh, you know, biomechanical positions and exercises, as well as you know, some strategies to minimize joint stress uh, at various periods of our training career can be really useful um, to make sure that we stay healthy. Because if you're not healthy um, and the tissues are destroyed, uh, sorry, the joints are you know, damaged to the point where you can't load the tissue, well, the tissue is not gonna grow. So, uh, managing joint health is really important. When we train in one plane, as most bodybuilders and strength athletes do, so the sagittal plane, um, that's when we start to see um, a lot of overuse injuries and just you know beat down on the joints. So joint health is important. Sweet. Uh, that's everything that I have anyway. Unless yeah. you guys want to add anything before we go? Add? No, it's, it's been a pleasure. I'm very yeah. excited to have Danny in Melbourne. Um, glad he's experiencing Melbourne weather. and. Yes exciting times ahead yeah hopefully the rain didn't destroy the last five minutes but it's just you talking yeah so. it's just me talking <laughs> so it's not too much of an issue <laughs> all so right guys <laughs>
Thanks for joining us, guys, and we'll hopefully see you all soon at the Optimizing Body Composition Seminar. If you have questions, feel free to ask, and tickets will be available in the link below this video uh, or on Sigma Nutrition, and be sure to check it out, and hopefully you can attend, and we'll see you there. Peace. There's no...